was in full bloom. As Enlightenment principles took hold, however, a number of problems began to emerge. And suddenly rationalism didn't seem to be the savior so many hoped it would be. First, as the Cartesian foundation for knowledge supplanted the classical Christian formulation, philosophers and scientists began to run up against the limits inherent in independent human thought. Slowly, the great hope of the French encyclopedists and others that man's reason alone could penetrate the mysteries of life began to crumble. By the middle of the 20th century, the twin discoveries of relativity and quantum theory nailed the coffin of classical materialism shut. Another serious setback occurred when the French Revolution, in many instances a well-intentioned experiment in Enlightenment humanism, the ground. And finally, as far as this summary is concerned, there was the irrepressibility of the human spirit. Despite materialism's cold insistence that all that existed was matter and its motion, man's innate thirst for meaning, redemption, and transcendence simply refused to go away. And the scriptures tell us why. For he has put eternity in their hearts. This God-shaped vacuum as the famed philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal called it, goes to the very core of man's existence and cannot be filled by any creator longer acceptable to the supposedly enlightened architects of this modern era. New solutions had to be found as everything from primitive naturalism, radical individualism, intense subjective experience, a classless society, psychoanalysis, and the alchemy of the subconscious mind, and altered states of consciousness, were trotted out by the intelligentsia to fill the vacuum left by the rejection of God. Ironically, by the latter half of the 19th century, the great revolt against the Christian worldview, an incremental revolution that was supposedly sparked and sustained by man's bold quest for rational knowledge, have become progressively irrational. And everything that has followed in its wake has only served to confirm Chesterton's famous observation. Belief number one, all religions are equally valid. With the foundations of Christendom being set aside, people ran everywhere in search of answers to the mysteries that science had either refused to acknowledge or failed to penetrate. European colonization in India, China, and Africa in particular sparked a major revival of Eastern and occult religions in the West. Belief number two, a corollary of number one. Primitive cultures, because they are closer to man's natural, uncivilized state, contain truth the Christian West has lost or suppressed. This idea was popularized first by Rousseau and then later by the writers and artists of the Romantic school. The influential German philosopher and key initiator of the God is Dead movement, Friedrich Nietzsche, pushed the envelope even further by calling for a literal reversal of Christian values, substituting instead the will to power and a more primal, what he termed Dionysian approach to everything from philosophy to sexual ethics. And it's also quite significant that Nietzsche and other metaphysicians saw music as a primary carrier of this new ethos. In response to these potent ideas, all manner of occult thought and practice began to spread throughout Europe and eventually America. Seances and spiritualist societies became increasingly popular. Foreign service personnel, enamored with the sex cults of Hinduism, wrote tracks introducing these arcane practices to a wider audience looking not only for mystery and meaning, but new ways of Illuminati spread the gospel of occult enlightenment, making particular inroads in academia and secret societies like the Masons. New drugs were introduced, along with the occult notion that they could be used to spark the fire of psychic enlightenment. In England, Yeats took mescaline and joined the Golden Dawn. 
Shelley practiced ritual occultism, free love and satanic blasphemy, dying young and leaving behind the troubled founder of modern horror. The Hashish Club in Paris was frequented by Baudelaire, Dumas, Flaubert, Rambeau and others. Their school of romanticism perfected the now common practice of divorcing art from morality, producing art for its own sake while celebrating Dionysian madness, triggered often by alcohol and drugs, as a key to literal inspiration. Gurus, prophets, ascended masters, shamans, witches, mahatmas, alchemists, and New Age messiahs flourished, and the river of occult thought became progressively mainstream. And nowhere was this stream more powerful, wider, flowing into more lives, than when it coursed through the channel of art and its most potent form a new style of music that came out of Africa via the Caribbean and the port city of New Orleans a music whose rhythm patterns serve as conduits for spiritual energies linking individual human consciousness world and a new type of worshiper remade in the image of these gods well Having outlined the historical backdrop, let's now connect the dots using a few brief examples that closely follow the pattern we outlined. The form it's identified not so much by its primary emphasis on rhythm as by the use of these rhythms, coupled with repetition and the relative simplicity of the music to induce a form of trance state. Shamanistic music, in turn, purposely uses these states of altered consciousness byproducts of the performance. Well, using our analogy, any number of modern intellectuals became interested in shamanistic cultures, thinking that they perhaps held a key to enlightenment and human evolution. Titled from a line by William Blake's Gnostic treatise, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, became a classic of psychedelic literature. A decade later, the book, as well as Blake's writings, became the inspiration for both the name and the spirit behind one of the most influential bands in rock, The Doors. Let's swim to the moon uh -huh. Let's climb to the tide Keyboardist Ray Manzarek explained, at the time, we had been ingesting a lot of psychedelic chemicals, so the doors of perception were cleansed in our own minds. And we saw the music as a vehicle to, in a sense, become proselytizers of a new religion, a religion of self, of each man as God. That was the original idea behind after deconstructing both Christianity and Western culture, he wonders what should take its place. Manzarek described the transformation of Morrison, the Lizard King, as the spirit guides came over him in concert. It was a psychological horror, freak show in the sense of the shaman, the sense of vibrating in harmony together. It becomes, it's, it, it's like a pagan, it's like some sort of a mystical Christ, the, uh, uh, the release of uh, kundalini, the kundalini power expanding in your body and curling and coiling upwards, uh, the Aquarian age in which we'll finally begin to merge all the religions and sciences and arts and whatnot and we'll all realize that we are gods. Jim Morrison was a god to himself. I'm a god unto myself. We are all gods unto ourselves. So to put it outside of yourself is a seeking, uh, is, is, is a false messiah. That's a messianic, that's the, the end of two trip. I salute the god with it. There's a religious pilgrimage. The LSD kick. I salute the goddess within you. It's a religious ecstasy. Following a very similar tack was the grand old man of the psychedelic 60s, Timothy Leary. Psychologist, Harvard professor, and consummate free thinker, Leary coined what may have been the essential mantra of the rock and roll revolution. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. We're turned on, and we're tuned in, and we're very dropped out. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. 
what I'm saying happens to be the oldest method of human wisdom. Look within, find your own divinity, detach yourself from social and material struggle, turn on, tune in and drop out. In what may be one of the most